Hi, this is Heather Box from The Million Person Project, and The Million Person Project is a global project about love, storytelling, and connecting change makers. And I am so excited to be here today with Vien Trung, who is the director of Green For All. So Vien, I'd love for you to introduce yourself to the viewers. I'm Vien. <laughs> I direct Green for All. Uh, Green for All is a national organization working to create a green economy strong enough to lift people out of poverty. What we do is create solutions to pollution and poverty, and we want to make sure that we're putting people of color at the front of the climate movement. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining this conversation about the power of storytelling. Yay! It's going to be fun. <laughs> and I would love to just start off by hearing what are the role of stories in your work? I think it's all about stories. It's all about people. At the end of the day, the work we're doing is all about how do we make the lives for people, especially people who don't have a voice, better? How do we help to make sure that people who don't have the political access, the policy expertise, who are not necessarily showing up in hearing rooms or testifying in meetings, how do we make sure that their voices and their stories are told, their experiences mm -hmm. are captured so that we can make the change that we need so their lives can be better? Cool. Yeah. And what has been your process to, to using your voice and sharing your story? And what stories do you share in relationship to your yeah. work about who you are? That's a good question. And it actually, it's kind of new for me to even use storytelling. New in that in the last couple of years I started doing so. When I was growing up, um, I'm the youngest of 11 kids. Wow. <laughs> born to a refugee family. My family came here um, right after the fall of uh, Saigon in Vietnam. And we wanted to make sure that we were improving our station in life. And so my parents were determined to make me a, the most assimilated child in the family, right? So they didn't speak any English. They sent me to church. They sent me to like all of the like make libraries. They wanted me to uh, be most assimilated. When I grew up, I had this mentality that I was supposed to act a certain way. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to look a certain way. I was supposed to be poised and eloquent. And um, that then Im involved me not sharing too much about my background or my story. And more recently, I realized, you know what? That is part of why I do this work. And that is why I actually need to talk about the, how I understand the world of equity and environment and poverty as interconnected and deeply, um, deeply symbiotic. And if we're going to have any chance at all of having real solutions, we actually have to un make sure that we, we tackle those two issues at the same time. And I had to be able to share my story because people need to know that I'm not talking about this as a, you know, as a nice to do. I'm actually speaking about it from a personal experience. And I still live in Oakland. I still raise my kids in Oakland. I still raise my kids in very similar communities as which, which I grew up in, in the hood. Um, and it's because I know the experience. It's because I, I've lived it, I continue to live it, that, it's that I can actually have the credibility to say, this solution will work or won't work. Mm. And this is what we need to do next. So when you're coming up with solutions for developing the green economy, yeah. this is a really helpful piece to be able to say, no, I understand yeah. this community because it's where I'm from. Yeah. And so I understand that these are the types of solutions that do work and these are the ones that we've had challenges yeah. implementing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. I, I live and breathe this issue mm. very, very literally, right? Mm. I live in the EJ community. I live in one of the poorest and most polluted communities in the state of California. I grew up here. I live, I mean, like my neighbors are, um, are living this experience. You know, my families are living this experience. I see kids who are struggling to make, you know, grow up in Oakland every day. Um, I had somebody who died in front of my house last year while I was holding my infants in my bed, like in, in my arms, rocking them to sleep. This is not for me, you know, some kind of romance or, or like, you know, story. This is about my day-to-day -day experience, how I'm raising my kids, the experiences of my family, mm -hmm. and the future of my kids. And so I don't know how to convey that if I don't, you know, actually share my story about why this work matters. Yeah, yeah. wow. And what are some of the solutions that, that are addressing the problems in your community or what is some of the work that you're doing now yeah for a long time I should say that I came to this work trying to figure out how to make the lives of my family and my neighbors and people who have lives like ours how do we make their lives better mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was gonna be through solving poverty 
And so I did housing and economic justice. And, you know, I, I was trying to figure out, like, how do we make sure people are not so poor? Mm. Um, and I still feel like that's absolutely the centerpiece of, of a lot of things that are, um, you know, the, the solutions that we try to figure out. But I've always had this nagging worry that we're helping the immediate lives of our families better, be better. But what about 20 years from now? Yeah. And what about 50 years from now when my kids are growing up? What kind of air are they going to breathe? What kind of water are they going to drink? Is it going to be like Flint where they can't even drink the water and they need to buy bottled water just to bathe in? Um, and that, for me, came together when I, when I learned about Green For All and thought, oh my gosh, you can do two things at once. It makes my heart happy, mm. um, especially since I have an attention span of a gnat sometimes. I was like, oh, I can do all of it. <laughs> um, and what we're doing now is saying, Polluters who continue to poison our air and our water, they have to fix what they broke. We pay for the garbage we put on our sidewalks. They have to pay for the, the stuff that they're doing to our health, our air, our fundamental human rights. Let's make sure that they clean up, and if they can't pay up, and that money has to come back to the communities that they poisoned. And so when we did that in California, um, I would join a coalition with uh, Asian Pacific Environmental Network, Coalition for Clean Air, Ella Baker Center at the time, Natural Resources Defense Council, um, NAACP, and we passed a law in California that did that. Um, that made polluter pays fund come back to the communities that were most impacted, and it's created the biggest fund in history so cool. for low-income communities. And so now that's the work we want to replicate nationally. Wow, that's yeah. so cool. And what is, I know that you've been doing some work in, in Flint around yeah. the water crisis and yeah. all of that. Can you tell our viewers what is going on in Flint and what it is that Green for All is doing about it? Yeah. When we first, I first heard about Flint the way most folks did on the news. And my heart stopped for a second and thought, oh my gosh, 100,000 something people in Flint, over 9,000 kids under the age of six got lead poisoning. And... I mean, lead poisoning, water, right? drinking with the water, yeah. with the pipes. And so what happened in Flint is the governor decided to switch from the water that they were getting from Detroit to use their Flint River water. They forgot to add some anti-corrosion chemicals in there. The water started corroding the pipes. The pipes were made out of lead. Lead started getting into the water, poisoning all the people who were using the water to cook with, to clean with, to drink from, to bathe in, everything. And um, this was happening for two years without much national attention. Crazy. And yeah. what we know about lead is it, it can cause some very serious long-term brain damage, especially for young kids. Um, and I, I, I honestly just couldn't wrap my mind around it. And so um, we stepped back and I thought, well, you know, I think very much in the environmental movement, a lot of people think, well, somebody's handling that, right? Like right. somebody's, somebody is like, job is to fix that right? right and you think you don't need to go in and help with anything um, and I thought well somebody's gonna cover Flint right and when we started um, just saying so what's happening like just out of concern and solidarity like what's happening we found out that very little is happening actually and much more needs to happen I think there are some good movements happening there's some great organizations on the ground with Flint Rising Michigan Faith in Action um, Water Defense EPA is doing some great stuff now but we forgot about it in the media already. You know, if you turn on the news, you don't hear about it anymore. And Green For All, we wanted to make sure their stories in Flint were never forgotten. So we went back and, um, to the Flint residents and asked, what, what can we do? And it's important to start from a place of asking instead of saying, here's what we'll tell you what to do, right? Because we, ha we know that Flint residents, they have a very strong sense of what their community needs. They have a very strong sense of what their kids needs. They have a strong sense of what will work and what won't work. And it doesn't help to have any national organization or outsiders come in and say, we'll tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. So we came in and, and really just humbled ourselves and said, what, what can we help with? And um, what do you need and how can we be of service? And they told us, we need to make sure our stories are never forgotten. Mm -hmm. We need to t make sure that our stories are out there. To your point about why stories are important, it's because it's about people. It's about humanizing people. It's about making sure that this isn't pathologized into like a, these are folks who nobody needs to care about. Mm -hmm. This is an issue about real human beings, 100,000 people, who needs to make sure that their faces, their stories, their lives are remembered by the decision makers, by the mm -hmm. policy makers, by you know, media, so that the resources are directed as appropriately. Mm. Yeah. 
And I think that that's a really important distinction. And it's something that we've been exploring a lot in this interview yeah. series about the power of stories yeah. is the idea of, of telling someone else's story versus amplifying someone else's story. So what is the difference between, you know, helping someone get their story out yeah. and sort of taking someone's story and telling it for them? Oh. And so that's yeah. been something that we, you know, and that's what the work that you're yeah. doing in Flint, that what I really see is the amplifying of people's voices. Yeah. And yeah. that's the part of storytelling that I think is so critically important. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, what we did was we got out the way. We brought the cameras, we brought the film crews, we brought the media. We had like all of these media outlets, for national um, folks from NBC to Now This and BuzzFeed. And we brought all these folks uh, on the bus, convened them, and we got out the way and gave the mics to the residents and said, here's a camera, tell your story. Just tell folks why, what is happening in Flint, why does it matter, and why should folks come and help, and what is the help that you want mm -hmm. to see? And we were not there. I mean, if you see the footage now of a lot of these, um, the stories that were shared, you wouldn't even see Green for All. We were kind of invisible in the background, just, you know, we created a platform, and that's, as you were saying, amplifying. We created a platform and handed the mic and said, all right. That distinction to me yeah. is so important because what, what I don't want from this work and yeah. from this interview series is for people to go out and say, okay, yeah, I should go tell yeah. other people's stories yeah. for them. Yeah. I believe in people telling their own personal story. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, people can and should speak for themselves. And the intention, if I'm, capt if I'm understanding your project, Made in Person project, is it's about making sure people understand the humanity behind the folks who are speaking for their own stories. And how dehumanizing is it for somebody else to take their story mm -hmm. and then frame it in whatever suits them. It's about actually seeing other people for who they fully are. Mm -hmm. And you take that opportunity away when you don't let them speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, perfectly said. Yeah. Perfectly said. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, for me, what I would love to know is a little bit more about your process personally. So you were saying that you had hesitated sharing your story or you just hadn't. Yeah. And then you have decided to share it in different ways and see it as interconnected in your in your work. So yeah. what was that process like for yeah. you? And what's your advice for someone who is sort of saying, no, on purpose I'm not sharing my story because I'm trying to sort of like not show people where mm -hmm. I'm from or what, yeah. what would your advice be for someone who's who's negotiating that well first we have to admit it's hard right it's not I mean even for me it took years of building up to it and a lot of our stories especially the ones who are like the juicy ones in our minds or in our ears um, are the ones that are hard you know there's a lot of trauma behind that there's a lot of pain behind that and surfacing the story to tell it it's a healing process but it also re, re, you know, conjures a lot of those old feelings, and I think it's hard. Um, so I just want to, one, empathize with that position, but two, also know that there is a very liberating part of when you tell your story, you let go of a lot of the pain that has been around it, and it's a healing process. So sometimes I actually use storytelling as a way to heal myself, and I just go out there and I just talk about stuff, and, it, and in some ways the sunshine then cleans out a lot of the things, right? And it's no longer like a scary, dark thing in my soul. It's now like, let me tell you about the most embarrassing thing that happened to me and how it connects to, you know, whatever, right? Um, and in this, in this world now, when we are increasingly having categories around people, of you are a Republican or a Democrat, you are liberal or conservative, you are on this issue or that issue, it, doesn't allow us to have the ingenuity, the creativity to really get at what is it that makes for a better society, right? We then go into like separate camps on the different sides instead of focusing on these are, you know, if you were a conservative and a Republican and you're my neighbor, like, okay, well, let's have a conversation. We both want a really beautiful society. How, you know, and we both want love and security. Understanding who you are then allows me to build with you. And in this world, when everybody, the media tries to put us into like abject categories without humanity, telling our stories allows us to break out of those bounds and say, no, actually, we want the same things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important about storytelling. Yeah, yeah. I do too. Yeah. I mean, you just said that. So that's 
exactly what I'm always trying to express. Yeah. So thank you for putting yeah. that in such beautiful words. And one of the things that I would love to ask you in closing yeah. um, is just what your vision is for the world going forward. Like, what is your big vision? What's Vienne's vision? Mm. That's a great question. <clears throat> you know, I, I want to make sure that my kids who are growing up at 946010, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, I want to make sure that my kids are growing up in Oakland, 94601, um, just because of that, that their lives are not 12 years shorter than the kid who's growing up in Walnut Creek. I want to make sure that the entrepreneurs on my block who've been struggling to make ends meet are able to see their, their um, a future for their work, right? They have a job to you know build on companies and to bring that prosperity back to places like Deep East Oakland. Um, I want to see a future where our energy is from the sun, where we don't have to rely on big mega companies and corporations and infrastructure and systems, um, but we can actually have more of an independent, self-determined community, right? Um, I want to have communities where we are healthy, that we can have healthy foods. In West Oakland and in Richmond right now, they don't, West, Richmond doesn't even have a traditional grocery store. Richmond, this is a whole city. You know, I want to make sure that that's not happening. Um, and I want to make sure that just because of the color of our skin, the wealth, the language, the access that our parents had, it doesn't limit us from what our kids can have, what, our, what, what possibilities they can have access to. Um, I want to make sure that, you know, just because of, um, yeah, that what we were born into doesn't mean what we can or cannot do. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, it's such a beautiful vision. Yeah. And so Julian Mosin McQueen, who is the co-founder of the Million Person awesome. Project and also works at Green For All, he, we love him. <laughs> he says that you're a bit of a fashion icon in oh. the sustainability movement. And yeah, and he told me that I had to get your best fashion tip to share with our viewers. So <laughs> every time I see you, you are rocking it out, H Box. You, I know, yes, you need to have a whole show on that. Um, I don't have any fashion tips at all. I don't know what. I I've never heard him say that to me. Um, well, let me see. You know what? Accessory game is is good. Accessory yeah. game is good. Yeah. Comfortable shoes is good. <laughs> yeah. When you're when you're living a good life and when you're happy and when you're joyful, I think that's like the best fashion. Oh, yeah. that's so cute. Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining this conversation today. And I would love for you to tell our viewers how they can stay in contact with you and be a part of the things that you're doing at Green For All. Yes, Earth Week, we're making sure that everybody is getting the message out that if you break it, you fix it. And that's true of Flint. If you break the pipes, then you got to fix it. And that's true of uh, polluters around the country. If you broke it, if you poison our air, if you poison our water, fix it. Make polluters pay. And make sure that money is coming back to our communities. So hashtag fix Flint and hashtag make polluters pay. <laughs> OK, yes. great. Thank you so much, Vian. And thank you, viewers, for tuning in. Please check out Green For All. And also, we'll see you tomorrow here for more Stories Are Power. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm.